Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Square foot gardening lets you grow more in less space. This year we're going to put it to the test. Today we're starting ours. Also, onions are easy to grow and add flavor to your food. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Peter Richards. Peter is our local gardener, and Walter Battle will be joining me later. Hi, right, Peter. We're going to talk about square foot gardening. So here's yeah. the first question. What is square foot gardening? Okay, a square foot gardening is an idea that you can plant lots of food in a small space. Okay. Uh, and so you divide your garden into square foot chunks, and then inside that chunk, you plant a certain number of plants. And the idea is that with this dense planting, it cuts down on weeds, it increases mm -hmm. production. And this year, we're gonna take that, and we're gonna put it to a test. We have here, right. we have a four foot by eight foot garden bed. Okay that we have previously put uh, a fair amount of compost in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so we're going to divide it out and we are going to plant a few plants and okay. just get it ready to go for the whole year. And throughout this year, we're gonna do updates on this. Good deal. Good and deal. Uh, online at familyplotgarden.com, we'll keep a tally of kind of a, a blog of what we've done nice. and a tally of what we've harvested out of it. So this is the first time I have actually done a square foot <laughs> garden. I've done similar ideas, but not like this. And so I'm really curious to see how much we can I get out too. of this little bed. I am too. I'm with you. This is the first time for me too, so I'm kind of excited about it. Yeah. We're going to see what it's going to turn out to be. All right, yep. so what do we need to start? So the first thing we need to do is we have to divide our garden into square foot chunks. Okay. So we're going to do that with, we have some baling twine here. Okay. Now uh, you can do it with thin uh, boards. Uh, you can do it just basically however you want to. Uh, but we're going to use the twine. Okay. Yep. So we also have here, we have some landscape staples. So if you want to, Let's go ahead and measure yeah. out. Okay. If you want to take this, let's figure out where a foot away from this wall is here, down there, and you can stick a staple in to mark it. And so just, we're going this way? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, all right. So, okay, you got it. There we go, yep, so a foot there, a foot there. there. Hey, pass me a couple of those. Yep, there you okay. go. Going a foot, okay, this one here. Okay, now let's go do the other side. Okay. Same thing. Same thing. Now let's do the short side. Okay. Do the one down here. Okay. You got it? Yep, I got that one. Okay, so that should be all we need the tape measure for today. So now we're going to take what we've marked and string There's the twine. If you want to just tie it. Can you, Does that have to be tight? Uh, or? Uh, just tight enough that it's not going to wander. All right. Just move the staple back here and tighten it up. Okay. Let's do the next one. Okay. Okay, I'll go the other direction. So now our bed is divided into one foot by one foot squares. Okay. And a lot of times when you plant with traditional gardens, you might string off stuff and then you, if the string goes away, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Because you planted it. Here though, you want to keep the string the whole year. Because uh, what we're going to do here is I've made a plan <laughs> for this garden. This plan is laid out square foot by square foot. And in some places, I'm going to be planting multiple crops through the year. Okay. So I've gone through, I've tried to get, you know, figure out that, for instance, we have spinach. And spinach will be done at about April 15th where we are. Okay. And so then, it, that will be replaced by bush beans. 
and that's going to last until about August 1st, and it'll be replaced by broccoli mm -hmm. for the fall. Got it. So, um, so I've planned this out to try and utilize the space as good as possible. And then also here, there's some places like I'm going to be growing cantaloupe, sweet potatoes, watermelons, tomatoes. Wow, so you can grow all of that in this bed. Well, okay. I'm going to, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of this walkway where sure. we are. So like, for instance, the cantaloupes are going to be planted here, but, but I'm going to have them run out. Right. You know, the watermelons are going to be here, they're going to run out. It's going to be interesting. Um, and then the tomatoes, which are going to be <laughs> tall, we have <laughs> tomatoes and cucumbers, they're going to be planted against this side here, and we have to put the stakes in for them now. Okay but that's the north side of the garden so you kind of have to keep track because the north side is going to have the tall plants so it doesn't shade anything gotcha. in front so let's go ahead and put in the stakes for um for the tall plants here right. and we're going to rather than having them go straight up and down we're actually going to lean them out so that uh, they go out over the lawn here a little bit and that will help us by uh, making it so that we're using space that's not over the bed. Yeah, and I'm not gonna put up the trellis right now, but it's just good to get that in so it's ready to go. Each square has a certain number of plants. So the big plants would have one square, and the biggest plants actually might have four squares. So something like a full-size cabbage plant might use four squares because it gets, you know, it gets pretty big. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but smaller plants, use less. So we're going to plant onions and <laughs> peas today because it's February. And it's and that time. It's that time to do that. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to plant nine onions in a square and we're going to plant nine peas in a square. Wow. So according to my plan here, <laughs> we're going to be planting two squares of onions Oops. and we're going to plant nine each. So what we want to do is space them in a grid with a gap around it to leave space between it and the next square. Gotcha. Okay. There's that. Okay. And now one of the advantages of the square foot garden here is because it is so dense, the plants will shade out the weeds. So it's it is low maintenance. I'm gonna So you can actually have a low maintenance garden, huh? Yeah, a low maintenance garden. How about that? And even if you do have weeds, you look at this, how big is this? This won't take yeah, much to weed. Well, also no time. It has all of this loose soil in it that you never walk on. Mm -hmm. And because you never walk on it, it never gets compacted. So even if you do have to weed, it's just, you can go through quickly. Yeah. And then the other thing we're going to do today is we're gonna plant peas. Peas, okay. And those are gonna be in these four spots over here. And those are also nine per. So it's nine per square. Nine per square. Uh, your stereotypical uh, square foot garden bed is four feet by four feet. Uh, this one's four feet by eight feet because it is so small, I can reach anywhere in the garden bed without ever stepping on it. And you can grow it on raised beds. So, you know, even if you can't bend over to the ground, gives you a place to, you know, you can garden even if you're not able to bend over very far. There we go. And we're going in our square foot garden. And as we move along here in a few weeks, we're gonna be planting lettuce. Okay. Cause it's gonna get to that time. Okay. Um, and the, It'll slowly fill up and turn over as we go through the year. All right, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you much. Thank you. All right. Determinate versus indeterminate. Yeah, and you'd be surprised uh, how many people really don't know what that means, uh -huh. and they grow a lot of tomatoes. That's right. And they'll say, well, you know, my tomatoes just set all their fruit, and then they were done. Well, that's the determinant. That means it's set a determined time that it's going to produce, and those are usually commercial varieties, so everything gets ripe and harvested at one time, and that's really a good thing for a commercial mm -hmm. sure producer. Is. But see, that for the home gardener, you know, if they have the room, see, indeterminate varieties, as long as they're growing and flowering, they're putting on fruit so they can wind up being pretty darn big by the end of the season. <laughs> right. you, know, you might need a step ladder uh -huh. to get, but you know, some of the varieties that are determinate are Roma, uh, Celebrity is a common, mm -hmm. but it's sort of semi-determinate. It can get a little bigger than what's, you know, the, the regular just in varieties of determinate. Uh, 
mountain spring, mountain. There's some of those new ones in the commercial end that are determinate. But for the indeterminate, they're like better boy, big yeah, boy, boy, boy big early boy. girl, yeah. all the little cherry tomatoes yeah. that just keep going, like million. What's that sweet million? Yeah. You know, that thing can just cover up your house and go over and, you know. All right, Walter, I can smell something on the table here. Yes. It smells like onions a little bit, you know? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And, and, and I'll tell you, Chris, I must say, I am an onion freak. <laughs> All right. <laughs> just to tell you, I absolutely love them. I mean, they're just a very versatile vegetable okay. that you can use as far as cooking and all of that. And since I have to do all the cooking at the house, I've just learned to love them. Okay. Just to tell you. Well, we have the right man for the job to talk about onions then, right? Hopefully, yes. All right. Well, we have some questions for you about those onions there, Walter. So when are onions planted? Uh, well, here in, here in the Mid-South area, and I'm mainly talking about the Memphis area, okay. uh, I would say usually February and early March. Uh, it's usually one of our very first vegetables that we put out there, okay. uh, you know, each year. So uh, you go out there, it's, it's, it kind of gets me fired up for the growing season because <laughs> I'm like, hey, I can finally go out here and and you know, and throw me up, as old folks say, throw me up some onion rolls <laughs> and uh, and start planting. So hey, I, I'm I'm ready to go now. You know, and I'm just looking forward for the weather to get warmer okay. at that point. But I know I have my onions. All right. So what about frost though? Do we need to pay attention to frost dates? You know, if somebody's watching this over in East Tennessee or. Well, basically, since we plant them so early, they usually gonna come through most frost dates anyway. Now, I know Dr. Kelly informed me before we came on air that. What, zone seven is? Is April 10th. April, April 10th. 10th. Okay. Usually so. kind of the, the marginal, after the April the 10th in zone seven, we should be frost free okay. yeah. based on prior, you know, data. Okay. So, but we could always get something strange happening. Yeah, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. So does it matter how far apart you set the bulbs? Yes. Uh, now, if you're going to, you know, grow your onions for what we call bunch onions or spring onions, you want to set them about two inches apart from each other. Uh, you know, because obviously we're going to get the little small heads here. But now if you're going to wait and grow them as for dry onions mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, then you'll want to set them probably about six to eight inches apart. Okay. Uh, because some of these, some of these can get kind of big. And, uh, you know, if I'm going to have a good hamburger, <laughs> I want me a nice <laughs> big onion on that hamburger. But that's basically how uh, you, you can plant them. Okay. And also, <laughs> even the onions that we grow for dry onions, uh, you can pull them early as green onions. It's just kind of up to, okay. up, you know, up to you to do that as the gardener. That's kind of your choice. So some people plant them kind of thick and, and knowing that they're going to pull some mm -hmm. out and leave some there to grow later for, um, you know, the dry onions. So it just kind of depends. Okay. How long to harvest? You know, that's uh, what most folks want to know, right? Yes. Uh, basically, uh, if, if you're looking at, to harvest them for green onions, you're probably looking at about, I'm gonna say 60 days, uh, probably what you're looking at. So if you set them in uh, March, uh, what you let, what, April, May, so you should be getting some green onions by then to chop up and put in your turnip greens and, <laughs> and all those good things. Right. And also to put in your salads. I like slicing these uh, green tops here just to, you know, put in my salads as well. And now, of course, uh, if you're gonna wait a little later and have them grow for the dry onions, right. uh, then obviously we'll be, you'll be pulling those around, I would say mid-June is probably when a lot of them come off around our area. Okay, so how can you tell when they're ready though? Okay, as far as the, for the green onions, uh, when you go out early in the spring and want to pull some, uh, you just basically kind of just pull them up, and if you see that they're the size that you want, hey, start, you know that, right? you start getting them. <laughs> now, if you're going to wait till uh, later in the summer, when you're growing them for the dry onions, obviously, you know, the green parts will kind of fall over and flip over. And you can just kind of tell because they'll be pushed up kind of near the mm -hmm. soil edge. And again, just pull a few of them out. It'll be probably around mid-June. And, uh, and, 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 and you can just harvest them then and, and prepare it to dry them out okay. for cooking. Okay. All right, so how do you prepare dry onions for storage? Okay, well, once again, you know, you, you, you go out there and you'll kind of see, they'll start, you know, obviously pushed up near the soil. Mm -hmm. The green tops have, have fallen over, so you pull them out. And what I did, I saved an old patio uh, circular table that has the, 
uh, you know, the wire grid. Right, yeah. right, right. And I just, I put that in the garage, and I just pull them on there, and I just lay them on there. And I'm going to say I keep them there for about, I guess, three or four weeks in the garage. Uh, Seems like I get good air circulation in there because I always have my garage door up a lot of times. You don't wash them. Uh, no, don't wash them. Don't Please wash do em. not wash them. Yeah. And you just kind of see them, they'll begin to, you know, they'll tighten down just mm -hmm. like, just like this one has, you know, tightened down. Um, and pretty much they're, they're good to go. Now, at that point, you, you may say, well, hey, how do I store them? Right. You know, right. I know that's usually a big sure. question. And I keep mine pretty much out there in the garage. And, but those, those, when I bring them in, I put some up under the uh, kitchen sink. <laughs> uh, just throw them up under there. Right. But now the old timers, I remember my grandmother, uh, she used to put them in uh, stockings. And you would uh -huh. just see stockings hanging all throughout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've know, seen that before. Okay. Yeah. All right. So... You know, yeah. but but the main thing is, you know, don't put them near water and moisture because you're just going to get those funguses on there. What about varieties? Do you have a favorite variety? Uh, not really. Okay. I, I'll be honest with you. I just buy whatever they have at the <laughs> garden center. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's just where I live. We just don't get a lot of different varieties in those stores. <laughs> to, you know, <laughs> you know I, I don't know. But I will say this. When it comes to... Uh, the uh, dry varieties, I do like the Texas 1015. Okay. Uh, I, I love that variety. It's a sweet uh, onion that, that grows well here in our climate. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is, this is one right here. Mm -hmm. and they, they're very, very good. Uh, and I also get this question a lot. Uh, I know that the Valdelia onion yeah. is known for yeah. its sweetness yeah. and, and all of that. Yep. And, and a lot of people say, hey, I, I go to the store and I, I bought some of those onion sets but uh, my Valdez didn't turn out to be sweet like the ones that I buy. <laughs> From Georgia. And, and I think it has something, and maybe Dr. Kelly or yeah. Dr. Coop here can tell me, I think it has something to do with the soil type down so. there in that that's area. What, that's what so. I've that's always what heard, yeah. 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 That's is. what the true Vidalia onions from Georgia, they're not really, they say, they're not really the real Vidalias unless they're grown in the uh -huh. soil of Georgia, okay. in Vidalia, Georgia. Oh, okay, well, so, it's definitely soil type. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. soil type. Yeah. So, Apparently, mm. that's you what know. they say anyway. So, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, speaking of soil, what type of soil do onions prefer? Well, actually, uh, from a pH standpoint, they like a seven, a neutral oh, soil. Okay. But it, it goes back even down to about 6.6, 6 6.5 to okay. seven. So slightly acidic to... To, to what we call, I guess, basic uh, soil. So that's kind of what okay. they like. And they also like a good, uh, they like to be ridged up. They don't like to be, uh, you know, what we call wet feed or whatever, you know, just plant it where they get a lot of water. They like to be, you know, like to drain off. And you want a soil with good tilth. Oh, sure. You know, good organic <coughs> matter in it, and, and they'll do fine for you. Okay. Any uh, fertilizer we need to put down? Uh, usually with the ones I grow at home, I might go out there and put, like a triple ten or something like that okay. on there, but I usually have pretty good, pretty good success with with growing them there at my home garden. Okay, let's be some good soil down in Haywood County. <laughs> now, what about uh, diseases or insects that we need to be concerned about? Well, I, I would say as an extension agent, uh, I've never really ran up on any mm. in our area, but but there is a uh, uh, an onion maggot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that uh, I've read about, and they say it's pretty destructive, but it seems like I read more about it up in the East Coast side. Uh, so yeah, we, we don't tend to have that problem with the maggot here. Yes, yes, yes. We tend not to have anything mm -hmm. here, so I, I haven't ran across it. I have not either. So okay. I think here in our area we're fine. I think we're good. Okay. Well, we appreciate that good information about onions. Yes, we huh? like so. It's, it's, <laughs> we can tell you like onions. Oh, I love them. <laughs> I absolutely love them. Yes. Nice. Good deal. Huh? Next time, bring onion dip. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> I have just moved up this plant. It's a digitalis, um, but I also have um, three or four different colors of digitalis. So in order to remember which color and cultivar this is, I use tags. You can use, this is a plastic tag that can, it can be reused um, or it can just move along with the plant. This is also an option, a popsicle stick. Um, if, as long as you can write on it, this you might need to use a marker. With these, I use a pencil. Um, and what I'll do is just write the um, scientific name on there. You don't have to do that, but I do. And then I'll put the common name. This is Camelot Peach. 
most important to me, I like to keep information on my tag. I will put the date that it was seeded and then the date that I up-potted, which on the back, I will put a T for transplant and then I will put today's date. I also keep this tag. It just kind of lives with the plant all the way through. I will, um, when I plant it in the ground, I will set it in the ground beside that plant and then I will put a P on the tag, put the date it was planted and that actually can keep these and it gives me a record of how long it took from the plant to be seeded to when I actually planted it in the ground. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Ready. It's a great question. This year, I put in a raised bed garden with pressure-treated lumber. Is this safe for growing vegetables, or is there a concern about arsenic leaching into the soil and getting into the veggies? This is Neil in Dublin, Ohio. So, Booker, what do you think about that? Well, I don't, I don't like you treated wood in, around in vegetable garden. Okay. A lot of things can leak out, leak out of it into the soil. If you want to use some treated wood, you make sure that you may put some black plaster around if it can't leak into your, into your bed. Okay. And also, don't put your vegetable real close to the edge, of the, uh, right close to those uh, containers that right. you have in there. But use some black plaster and wrap those in there and try to make sure they don't, and put the soil in there, but stay some an inch from there okay. to make sure that you don't so get keep it, it in the middle. If you yeah, can. kind of, yeah, right. out from the side, but it won't get close to that in case something does leak, leak uh, come out of there. Okay. But that black plaster should catch some of it. Okay, Peter? So yeah, arsenic is if if you just ra did built your raised bed last year, arsenic's not going to be an issue mm -hmm. okay. because in 2004 mm -hmm. the EPA banned arsenic from pressure treated wood that homeowners can get. Right, and that's CCA. Right, CCA. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's chromated. So, yeah, copper cr arsenate. arsenate. Yeah. Right. Okay. So cr yeah, the chromium and the arsenic. Yeah. Which are both not good for us. Right. Um, and uh, but if you built a raised bed after 2004, a couple years later, which probably if it's a wood raised bed, you're probably gonna have built it since then anyway, because yeah, yeah. they don't True. last forever. Right. Um, but anyway, so it's not a huge issue. The copper can still leach into the soil, mm -hmm. um, but something you can do is if you keep your pH where vegetables like it, so you know 6.5-ish, uh, it tends to bond very tightly to the clay and organic matter in the soil and won't go into the plants. Um, as you get more and more acid, it becomes freer and freer. And then the other interesting thing is that plants tolerate copper much less than humans do. Mm. So we, yeah. we need copper yeah. just a little bit yeah. to um, be healthy. And plants need copper a little bit. You know, it's a trace, yeah. it's a micronutrient. But um, you're going to find that the plants are not going to do well and going to die before it would affect you mm. as a person because your body will just flush it out okay. as you go. That's good. So, but yeah, as Booker said, if you're concerned, that plastic, you know, awesome. lining your raised bed with plastic will, okay. you know, keep the, keep the copper out of the soil. Yeah. So. And you're right too, Peter, you know, since 2004, of course, you know, the, the treated wood is now treated with ACQ, right. alkaline copper quaternary, okay. right, which is a lot safer, okay? Or how about other alternatives? Maybe you don't yeah. want to use treated wood. You can use, we use what, cinder block. Yeah, you can use, yeah. cinder block. use block or use a wood that is going to hold up a little bit better, yeah. you know, a redwood or a cedar or something right. like that. So there are other alternatives, you yeah. know, to wood, you know, raised beds. Okay. Um, but thank you for the question. That was a good question. Thank you much. Here's our next viewer email. Would it be effective to spray my crepe myrtles with dormant oil? The last two seasons I've had problems with aphids. Do these pests winter over or do the eggs survive the winter or am I wasting my time? How about neem oil as a proactive treatment? And this is Rick from Corinth, Mississippi. So Peter, seems like aphids yeah. are everywhere. Yeah. For every plant species, there's an aphid species. And seems guess like. what? There is a crepe myrtle <laughs> and it, aphid. Yes, there's a crepe myrtle <laughs> aphid. Right. And they, they only eat it's, crepe myrtles. God, how about uh, that? Yeah, so crepe myrtle aphids are kind of interesting Yeah. because um, they do overwinter with eggs on the small branches, mm -hmm. um, but during the growing season, they give live birth. Yeah. Mm. So the last season of the year lays eggs. I don't know how they know it's the last <laughs> yeah. season of the year, but they lay, but they lay eggs. Um, so yes, a horticultural oil would, do, yeah. would take care of that problem. Um, I'd recommend spraying it towards the end of the winter, mm -hmm. just as it starts to warm up, but before the crepe myrtle leaves out. Sure. Okay. Um, and then you can do that if, uh, 
if that doesn't completely take care of the problem, because they some of them do fly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if if your crepe myrtles are not the only crepe myrtles that have this problem, if your neighbor's yeah. crepe myrtles have the problem too, you're not like, yes, you'll reduce the problem, but you're not gonna eliminate it. They're gonna be there uh, during the growing season. Um, you could, during the growing season itself, you could use a systemic insecticide. Mm -hmm. um, and, or maybe maybe you could go over to your neighbor and say, hey, we have this problem. Can I, <laughs> can can I, I spray you? horticultural <laughs> oil on your trees too? But right, yeah, neem right. oil or a horticultural oil, a dormant oil, <laughs> mm -hmm. that should take care of it. Yeah, you could definitely do that. And yeah. uh, you know, again, we're talking about the dormant oil. Yes, you can use dormant oil. oil. Just yeah, make yeah. sure that you look at the temperature yeah, ranges, we, right? Anything above it, yeah. 40 degrees, you can go ahead yeah. uh, and spray. Mm -hmm. And one thing you want to make a you can, when the bark all, all the leaves out there, you can see a little crevice and crevice. Oh, yeah. You can get off in there too. Make sure you get all over the tree. Right. Got to spray the entire tree. Work right. there when you can in there, in there to get rid of them. Right, because yeah. the oils are going to smother. It's smothering yeah, right. in there. So, so that's yeah. what you're looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I like to add this too. Uh, he asked about the neem oil. You can use neem oil. You can use it, yeah. use that in the you know in the spring or in mm -hmm. the summer. Yeah. You know, yeah. just read and follow the label on that. And the thing with neem oil too is it's versatile. Right. Mm -hmm. Is Antifungal okay. effects as well. Yeah, two things. Uh, so yeah, I mean that that, that that's, works. That's, that's you know, just in case you might have a fungus on your crepe myrtle. Yeah, too, right. yeah. Well, Peter's right. I mean, you got <laughs> apes are going to be there. Yeah. You're not going to get all of the eggs, right? right. But yeah, just get spraying those cracks yeah. and crevices. I think you'd be and fine. Talk to your neighbor too, like Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk to him. Make sure you do the same. Apes thing. will well, be yeah. there. Trust yeah. me. They if you see him again, just spray with neem oil during the summer. Yep. Spray. Yep. Yeah, but you have to get good coverage because once again, something's going to survive. You just want to reduce the number that. Do survive. Yeah, something is going to survive, but I do highly recommend uh, Mr. Rick, Rick using dormant oil. Mm -hmm. I definitely do. Yep. All right. So thank you for that question. All right. So Peter and Booker, that was fine. Thank you all much. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016 or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. We have over a thousand videos about all sorts of gardening topics at familyplotgarden.com. We also have links to extension publications with each video. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.